Veuillez vous asseoir, please be seated. Now the chorus will perform Dreaming of Home, a song they sang at the rededication ceremony of the Canadian National Memorial in Vimy in France. La chorale des jeunes interprétera maintenant Dreaming of Home, chanson qu'elle a chantée lors de la cérémonie de réinauguration du site commémoratif national canadien de Vimy en France. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Mr. Wayne Hamley, Chairman of the Fathers of Confederation Buildings Trust, and Mr. Claude Mitra, National Director for the Trust representing the province of Quebec. Veuillez maintenant accueillir Mr. Wayne Hamley, President du Groupe Fiduciaire des Édifices des Pères de la Confédération, and Mr. Claude Mitra, Director National representing the Conseil. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the 14th Simons Medal Lecture on the State of Canadian Confederation. Before we proceed, I would like to thank Donald Fraser and the members of the Confederation Centre Youth Chorus for that wonderful, splendid performance. Let's have a round of applause. Thank you. Their Honours Lieutenant Governor Frank Lewis and Mrs. Dorothy Lewis, the Honourable Premier Wade McLaughlin, Chief Justice David Jenkins, Mrs. Jesse Inman, CEO of the Confederation Centre of the Arts, Mr. George Kitching, co-chair of the Simons Lecture, Mr. Paul Gross, our distinguished speaker, and ladies and gentlemen. 
Mesdames, Messieurs, bienvenue à la causerie Simons 2015 afin de donner suite aux bons mots et aux salutations d'usage du président du Conseil. Nous reconnaissons la présence des dignitaires dont M. Wayne Hamblay vient de faire la mention et je tiens au nom du gouvernement de la province de Québec à saluer particulièrement son honneur, le lieutenant-gouverneur Frank Lewis et Mme Dorothy Lewis, ainsi que le premier ministre de la province de l'île du prince édouard l'honorable Wayne McLaughlin, ainsi que M. George Kitching, co-président des causeries Simons. Nous en sommes à notre quatorzième édition de cette causerie et de la remise de la médaille souvenir. Permettez que je mentionne et que je souligne l'esprit visionnaire du président du Conseil et des membres du groupe fiduciaire, voulant que cette conférence se déroule dans les deux langues officielles du Canada. The Simons Medal Lecture provides a national platform for distinguished Canadians to discuss the current state and future prospects of Confederation. The lecture is held each fall here at Confederation Centre to mark the anniversary of the first meetings of the Fathers of Confederation in Charlottetown in 1864. Confederation Centre of the Arts was built to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Charlottetown Conference. It was a unanimous decision of the Board of Fathers of Confederation Buildings Trust to create a truly national annual lecture that focuses on the state of Canadian Confederation. Each year, the Simons Medal honors a Canadian guest lecturer who has made an extraordinary contribution to the public good and to Confederation and to Canada. We are delighted that Mr. Paul Gross has agreed to deliver the 2015 Simons Medal Lecture. The Simons Medal Lecture is named after Professor Thomas H. B. Simons, a great Canadian patriot, educator, and fellow member of the Trust. We are pleased to recognize Professor Simons and his contribution to Canada. Unfortunately, Professor Simons is not able to be with us today. Cette conférence a comme objectif majeur d'offrir une occasion aux citoyens émérites du Canada de venir exprimer leur vision sur des sujets de leur choix pour l'avancement de la nation canadienne. Le Centre des arts de la Confédération a été construit pour commémorer le centième anniversaire de la Conférence de Charlottetown. Ce n'est pas sans raison que le Conseil des fiduciaires a pris cette décision unanime de créer cet événement et de choisir comme conférenciers d'éminents Canadiens qui, par leur engagement et leur savoir, sont reconnus pour leur rapport à l'avancement de la société. Nous sommes enchantés que M. Paul Gross ait accepté de prononcer la causerie 2015. Along with the honor of delivering the lecture, each distinguished guest speaker receives the Simon Medal in recognition of their contribution to Canada's Confederation. The Simons Medal is the creation of Dora de Pedri Hunt, a world-renowned Canadian coin and metal artist. This, her final design of her 95-year life, was inspired by the Jean-Paul Lemieux painting entitled Charlottetown Revisited. C'est avec émotion que nous présentons à nos conférenciers cette médaille souvenir et en reconnaissance de leur importante contribution à la Confédération canadienne. Ce souvenir a été créé par Mme Dora de Petrie Hunt, artiste de renommée mondiale. Elle s'est inspirée du tableau de Jean-Paul Lemieux, dont le titre est « Charlottetown revisité ». The 2015 Simons Medal and Lecture would not be possible if not for the generous support of the following. The Simons family, the province of Prince Edward Island, the government, uh, government of Canada, and the following endowment funds which make ongoing contributions to the Simons Medal and Lecture. The Frank and Dorothy Lewis Fund and the Simons Trust Fund. And I would also like to thank Jesse Inman and all of the staff members of the Confederation Center of the Arts who contribute to the success of this lecture. 
Comme toute autre grande organisation, le Centre bénéficie de l'appui de généreux commanditaires qui nous assurent de la continuité de cet événement. Nous tenons à remercier les membres de la famille du professeur Tom Simons, Wayne and Wilbur Embley, le gouvernement de la province de l'île du Prince-Édouard et le gouvernement du Canada. Nous remercions également les donateurs du Fonds fiduciaire qui nous manifestent leur appui depuis le début, Frank and Dorothy Lewis et la famille Simon. Nous tenons également à remercier Mme Jessie Inman et tous les membres du personnel du Centre des arts de la Confédération qui ont contribué au succès de cette série de causeries. Nous invitons maintenant le premier ministre de l'île du Prince-Édouard, l'honorable Wade McLaughlin, pour prendre la parole et nous présenter le conférencier d'aujourd'hui. It is now my pleasure to invite the Honorable Wade McLaughlin, Premier of Prince Edward Island, to introduce today's guest lecturer. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Bonjour tout le monde. Jalassi. Your Honours, Chief Justice Jenkins, Board Chair Wayne Hambly, members of the Board of the Confederation Centre, distinguished guests, I notice we have a number of members of the Legislature present, and above all, welcome to this great representation of our community, including uh, students uh, who are here to enjoy what I'm sure will be a very special and edifying uh, lecture. C'est un immense plaisir de vous souhaiter toutes et tous la bienvenue à cette uh, cause Simons et à la remise de la médaille Simons pour l'an 2015. I'm honored to bring warm greetings and best wishes on behalf of the government of Prince Edward Island and of course to introduce as our medal recipient and guest lecturer for 2015 Mr. Paul Gross. First, let me commend the Confederation Center of the Arts for sponsoring the Simons Lecture and, and Medal. This provides an outstanding opportunity for us to hear from distinguished Canadians on their views and perceptions of the current state and future prospects of Confederation. This is our 14th lecture, and the calibers of speakers and the quality of their presentations have made a vital contribution to a continuing national dialogue about our country and its future. In a little over one year from now, in 2017, Canadians will celebrate the 150th anniversary of Confederation. Our sesquicentennial will be a wonderful opportunity to rededicate ourselves to the values that have made this one of the greatest nations in the world. An essential contributor to our quality of life and a shaper of our values as Canadians is our culture. And as our 2015 Simons Lecturer, we are most fortunate to have one of the country's leading cultural contributors and ambassadors. Paul Gross is an award-winning actor, director, writer, and champion of the arts. I might add singer. I had an opportunity to stand beside him and sing Old Canada a few minutes ago. <laughs> he wasn't so strong on the island hymn, though. He's learning it. Paul Gross was honored with two Gemini Awards for his acting and writing in the television drama Due South, along with two Geminis for his work on the series Slings and Arrows. The film Passchendaele, which he wrote, directed, and in which he starred, won five Genie Awards, including for Best Picture. He wrote, directed, and co-starred in the feature film Hyena Road, an Afghan war drama which made its world premiere at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. And of course, he's made numerous other uh, appearances, including in the Republic of Doyle. Paul Gross's impressive credits include roles at Stratford and Broadway on the stage, and he has numerous, numerous film and television credits, and is widely recognized as one of our country's most prolific and multi-talented performers. He's also an accomplished singer and songwriter. Paul Gross's father was a tank commander in the Canadian Army, and their family moved around a lot. Born in Canada, 
He's lived in the United States, England, and Germany. From those experiences, he has learned to constantly reinvent himself and rise to new artistic challenges. And it's appropriate on the eve of Remembrance Day to have as our Simons lecturer a speaker with such a commitment to recognizing through the arts the role of the military in the creation and the continuity of our national identity. Paul Gross's acting career began at the age of 14 and his considerable talents were honed with a degree in drama from the University of Alberta. He's married to the Canadian actor Martha Burns with whom he'll be appearing on stage again shortly uh, for the first time in approximately a decade. They have two children. In 2013, our speaker was appointed an officer of the Order of Canada in recognition of his contributions to Canadian performing arts. He's the recipient of the Governor General's Performing Arts Award and the Pierre Burton Award. In addition to his performing roles, Paul Gross has been an advocate for the arts and a critical thinker about the arts, which indeed will lay the foundation for the lecture that we will enjoy this afternoon. While his career continues to establish new highs, he has already, been, he has already received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the, from the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television. I've already mentioned that Paul Gross is a versatile performer. I'm told that he once broke a rib while trying to cure hiccups by using the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> I'm also told that he has a connection with one of our previous Simons lecturers, Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, with whom he has been a dancing partner. <laughs> Whether breaking a lib, rib or breaking a leg, Paul Gross has made his mark on Canada and has earned the respect and admiration of all Canadians. Ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur et Dame, it's our great pleasure to invite Paul Gross to the stage as the recipient of the 2015 Simons Medal. Hi. I almost don't really recognize myself when I hear that. So I'm, it's a, what an amazingly attractive bunch of people you all are. It's a great honor to be here. Oh, well, that's what I'm looking for, my eyeballs. Um, this is my first time in Prince Edward Island and I'm sorry it's so short and it is, I don't know what's wrong with me, why it's taken me so long to come here. And uh, thank you for having me, and I am planning to return for an extended trip. And and I would very much like to thank the center for this surprising and wonderful honor. And I have to be honest, when I looked at the list of previous recipients, I thought some terrible mistake had been made and I got slipped in somehow. And Beverly McLaughlin, by the way, is a terrible dancer. But <laughs> enthusiastic, but just not very good. I would also like to thank the Mi'kmaq people on whose traditional lands we are gathered. Um, I know it says the arts in Canada, but I'm going to restrict it a little bit <laughs> to the areas I know something about. Um, <clears throat> I was born in Calgary General Hospital about a half a century ago, and all right, wait, I've already, this is, I'm only 12 words in, and already this talk is off to a shady start. I'm, 
soft pedaling my age, I'm actually 56. <laughs> which means I have been working professionally in the theater, film, and television for almost 40 years. And since those areas are my only real areas of questionable expertise, I'm going to limit my scope to that arena. During these 40 years, I've been witness to many changes, but none of them more monumental than the ones we are currently going through. But before I get to this, I need to say a couple of words about French Canada, and I apologize immediately that I don't, I'm not bilingual, and that's uh, much to my dismay and chagrin. Uh, but I will speak just briefly about French Canada, which will go largely unmentioned in this talk. And this is not an insult. This is simply a recognition that the two solitudes, as described by Hugh McLennan, are sadly and firmly entrenched in our cultural sector. English Canada is strangely uninterested in the cultural output of French Canada, and French Canada has returned the favor. And this is a miserable situation, a tragic waste of opportunity, but one that I hope someday will be remedied. And now to these monumental changes I'm talking about. Oh no, I lie. I'm going to back up a little bit. Actually, quite a bit. In fact, I'm going to go all the way back to my childhood. So buckle up, this could take a while. <laughs> my father, as Wade said, was an officer in the Armored Corps, and I grew up the life of a peripatetic army brat. And up until I entered university, I spent almost half of my life outside of Canada. And such an upbringing furnishes you with a weird and unique perspective on your country. As I saw Canada through the refracted prism of either an English private school or on an army base in Germany, or in the middle of a march for the end of the Vietnam War in Washington, D.C. Now, I was never uncomfortable living in a foreign environment, but I was always much more comfortable in my own country, to which we returned in between our various moves. And I was also blessed that my parents were assiduously devoted to making sure that my brother and I were grounded in all things Canadian, so we held Grey Cup parties and followed the Stanley Cup playoffs on uh, wireless or whatever, ham radio, I think it was called at the time. And we celebrated Dominion Day, now known as Canada Day, with fireworks that my father would somehow steal from somewhere. And at bases overseas, our schools participated in the wonders of Expo 67 by building model versions of the various pavilions, and we all learned the song, Canada, with those hideous lyrics, one little two, little three Canadians. <laughs> and we also hosted visits from the likes of George Chevallo and Maurice the Rocket Richard, whose autographs I have somehow lost to my lingering dismay. For the most part, however, I was tied to Canada through the arts, primarily literature, and eventually it broadened out. My mother is a dedicated reader and would read to us, and apart from many classics, she opened up the world of Canada's letters. I felt I could smeal, smell and feel the wide open prairie in W.O. Mitchell's Who Has Seen the Wind. I could feel the beating heart of the Maritimes in Ernest Buckler's The Mountain and the Valley. Mordecai Richler guided me on a thrilling tour of Montreal's excitements. And of course, I was introduced to the particular mysteries of this island province by Lucy Maud Montgomery. From a young age, I understood my country largely through the arts and understood and grew up with the idea that the arts were at the very core of our national definition. And when I finally returned to Canada to wind up my last stretch of high school in Toronto, I landed in a country that was in the midst of a cultural transformation. Smaller theater companies were springing up in cities across the land, and the larger, larger regional theater, theaters were relocating to brand new buildings the Manitoba Theatre Centre in Winnipeg, the Citadel Theatre in Edmonton, the Vancouver Playhouse in BC, this building we're in, among others. The CBC was expanding its reach and depth, and the National Film Board had secured its international status of one of the most prolific and innovative film laboratories in the world. This confidence was being felt across the entire spectrum of the arts, from dance to visual arts to music to publishing. It was an artistic awakening that was shared across the country, Attendance was high, and there was a deep pride in our capacity to create work that was uniquely ours and that could stand up to international scrutiny. 
I entered and attended the University of Alberta's BFA acting program, which is an exceptional training school both then and now, and where our focus was not on Broadway or on Hollywood, but on our future contributions to our unfolding national theater. And then when I graduated, okay, wait, that's, again, that's a little shady. Um, I didn't actually graduate. <laughs> I, I had, to, I had to take a logic class when I was in the second year, and, but the midterm rolled around, I didn't even know what building it was in, so I thought it was really prudent that I should drop the course, and then why I thought it equally prudent never to pick it up is beyond me, kind of a mystery. Suffice it to say, I, I never, I just can't truthfully claim I graduated. I can say that I did complete four years of training. And I left the U of A and entered a profession that was bristling with the thrill of possibility, both in the theater and in the realm of television and film. I worked as an actor and a playwright at the National Arts Center in Ottawa, the Toronto Free Theater, Theater Calgary, among others. I started acting for the screen at CBC, where I also began writing screenplays, the first being a television movie that was directed by Adam McGowan when we were both in our very early 20s and really had no idea what we were doing. And although there were many high watermarks in this period, for me, the apogee really was this triumphant tour to Moscow of the Stratford Festival's production of King Lear, starring Peter Ustinov. It was directed by Robin Phillips. We were international. And this cultural flowering was, to a great extent, a national project, driven by governmental will and generally supported by the Canadian public. And it was felt by many of my colleagues, myself included, that culturally we had arrived as a nation. The buildings were built, the companies were created, publishers were publishing, musicians were making music, painters were painting, dancers were dancing. We were strong and confident, and we were talking with our fellow countrymen about matters that concerned us collectively. And very few of us questioned the prospect that this bountiful, bountiful period would not continue after all, we were smart, we were successful. We narcissistically assumed that we were now an essential service, securely woven into the fabric of Canada as an indispensable element of our national, national future. In short, <clears throat> we allowed our vigilance to lapse, blindly assuming that now the cultural apparatus had been erected, it no longer needed our attention. And as our attention drifted, so did the nation's. I felt the first rumblings of trouble when I was working as a playwright at the National Arts Center. The government's books by then were in a sorry state of disarray and a new wind of austerity was blowing across the land affecting all sectors of Canadian society, the arts included. So the powers that be at the National Arts Center decided in a logic that calls to mind the distorted quote from the US military officer in Vietnam which went something along the lines, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. The NAC decided that to save the institution, it would be wise to eliminate the National Arts Center English Theatre Company, which was the resident group of actors, a company that accounted for, I think, less than 5% of the overall operating budget. Now that cut would in and of itself be disturbing, but what rattled the hell out of me at the time was that while the actors were let go, not one position was lost in the accounting department. And this seemed to me a harbinger of things to come, as though the slow decline had begun. Now, to be clear, this decline is not a straight line downward, and indeed there have been many great, extraordinary highlights and achievements across the spectrum of Canadian arts over the last many years. But in general, the cultural health of our confederation is not as robust as one might want. And at this point, I think it's important to underscore <coughs> that the solutions to this are not, is not simply cash. Much of it is structural, some of it is global and beyond our capacity to, to control. So money is not the simple panacea. The specific challenges faced by the theater, television and film are all quite different so I'll attempt to summarize what I see to be their problems as separate issues. 
Outside of Broadway and London's West End, theater is by and large a local event. It's supported by its immediate community. In the heyday of this cultural flowering, when theaters were being tossed bags of money, the narcissism took hold, and many theater companies were led by people who imagined their artistic vision was handed down from above, that if the audiences were too benighted to recognize their genius, what did it matter? The vision was all that mattered. There's actually <laughs> a tremendous anecdote from a smaller theater in Toronto that that once played one of their performances to no one. <laughs> Not one single person bought a ticket, a ticket on this particular day. The actors you know, naturally suggested that maybe there might not be much of a point in going out on the stage. And, <laughs> but the director railed at them, ordering them onto the stage, and he claimed that the sheer force of their performance energy would escape the theater and affect all of random pedestrians outside. <laughs> I don't think that probably worked. But. And this kind of artistic mania was terrific as long as the money kept flowing. Unfortunately, it's not much of a business model. And the money in due time began to dry up. Theaters started to experience declining attendance, and community disinterest, forcing them into unaccustomed position of having to fundraise, and all too often, a dumbing down of the playbills in an, in an attempt to fill the seats. And many theaters failed altogether. The Vancouver Playhouse closed its doors, as did a number of smaller theaters, and even the venerable Stratford Festival, the premier classical repertory theater in North America, came within a whisker of being shuttered. Now, happily for the theater, however, it is a local event, as I said. And in that respect, it enjoys a degree of insulation from the larger global instability and upheaval, such as is currently roiling the film and television world. While it may not quite be said that the theater is flourishing, it is not in retreat. And it has proved remarkably resilient, particularly as it reconnected with its audiences and began to serve those interests rather than its own almost to religious exclusion. Every year, a new crop of artists enter the field willing to work for preposterously low wages and bring youthful enthusiasm to the landscape. And small companies of dedicated kids are making theater in storefronts and pop-ups. Stratford has rebounded from the doldrums and the Shaw Festival moves now from strength to strength. There are, of course, ongoing problems the theater grapples with, every theater grapples with. Among them, how to integrate youth into more established theaters so they are not discouraged and leave the profession early, how to provide greater visibility and inclusion for those less represented on our stages, and how to relieve artistic directors of the constant burden of fundraising so they might more properly concentrate their energies on the productions they stage. Now, in some cases, these challenges could actually be relieved by more cash. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a case in point. I'm currently rehearsing a play at the old Toronto Free Theatre space, which is now part of Canadian Stage. And I began my professional career as a playwright at this theatre. I have returned now, after a very short 33-year hiatus, to discover that the dressing rooms are exactly as I left them. <laughs> they are inexplicably disgusting. In fact, I would go so far as to propose right here and now that the Canada Council for the Arts take immediate steps to set aside a discreet tranche of money to address the terrifying public health risk that is represented by the dressing rooms in the theaters across Canada. <laughs> And I mean all theaters except for this one. <laughs> so apart from the dressing room debacle, the theater has proved itself to be resilient, as I said, and as resilient as it has always been since its origins in the mists of history. It has adapted and met the recent challenges, and as of right now, is relatively stable, particularly when one compares it to the state of film and television. My friend and colleague Robert Lantos has described the state of film in Canada as apocalyptic. And this is not hyperbole. We are in terrible shape. But before we get into this, we need to, I need to make a distinction between two kinds of film. 
Essentially, there is studio film as produced out of Hollywood, and then there is the rest of the world, which we call independent film. Studio pictures carry mammoth budgets, not uncommonly in the range of $200 million to $250 million. Independent film operates on budgets that are a tiny fraction of that, generally in the range of about $5 million. Uh, for Additional context, we also need a brief thumbnail of the history of cinema in Canada. Film exploded onto the scene in the 1920s, and very rapidly, fledgling studios based out of Los Angeles like Warner Brothers and MGM came to dominate the field. And alarmed by this, most Western governments took steps to not only stimulate a domestic film industry, but to control the means of distribution. Because if you don't control the means of distribution and exhibition, then you don't control your industry. As an example, the UK enacted the Cinematographic Act of 1927, which stimulated that 15% of all films shown in the UK had to be of Commonwealth origin. To this day, <clears throat> Britain has and continues to enjoy a fairly robust film industry. Canada, on the other hand, took no steps, no such steps. Worse, it cowered in the face of aggressive moves by Hollywood who to this day still considers Canada to be part of its domestic market. A case in point would be a proposal that was tabled in the House of Commons in 1947, proposing that a tariff be imposed on Hollywood films. The Motion Picture Association of America quickly dispatched a hatchet man who met with the rubes of Louis Saint Laurent's government, arguing that tariffs were heinous, sinful, and proposed and said that they would undertake to shoot some of their movies in Canada thereby promoting tourism. They further proposed that they would include in their movies some nice words about Canada. <laughs> and the con worked. <laughs> the idea of protecting a domestic industry was stifled, and with few exceptions, Canadian cinema was virtually moribund until 1967 with the creation of the Canadian Film Development Corporation, which is now known as Telefilm Canada, our main national funder of film. This period also witnessed a great drain of talent as such luminaries as Norman Jewison, Arthur Hiller, Ted Kotcheff, and others migrated to Hollywood in search of work. So from the very beginning, Canadian cinema was off to a shaky start. I should note that the one, one of the happy exceptions to this dreary story is the creation of the National Film Board in 1938. It was headed up by a Scotsman named John Grierson. And by 1945, the NFB was one of the largest studios in the world, but sadly for feature film, as it's generally understood, the NFB concentrated on documentaries, animation, and experimental film. Movies largely were left unattended. The intervening period has seen many high points. The emergence of David Cronenberg, Adam Agoyan, Patricia Rosema, and others who have all enjoyed considerable success both at film festivals and at the box office. And while it cannot be said, although it cannot be said that Canadian cinema has ever been entirely robust, working in the shadow that is the juggernaut of Hollywood, whose movies overwhelmingly dominate our screens and whose publicity machine crushes anything in its path, Canadian movies have always struggled to connect broadly with audiences. And the numbers bear this out. In any given year, our share of the box office flutters somewhere between 1.5 and 3.5 percent. And alarmingly, those numbers are dropping fast. To put it bluntly, <clears throat> independent cinema is dead. And it's not just in Canada, it is dead globally. And this is not my opinion. God knows since this is what I do for a living, I wish it weren't so. But this is the reality that's being wrestled with by those whose business it is to distribute independent film. Beginning about seven years ago, cinema was hit with something like a perfect storm. The Hollywood studios, which used to produce between 30 and 40 films a year, contracted down to eight behemoth movies, the kinds of thrill rides that now dominate cinema. As a result, the streets of Los Angeles were awash with talented but unemployed actors, writers, and directors who naturally migrated into television, which has since exploded. 
At the same time, home entertainment systems dramatically dropped in price, and a terrific screen with excellent surround sound was suddenly within the reach of most household budgets. But the key culprit to this radical instability, if that's the right word, is the internet. Apart from the problems of piracy, which continues to wreak havoc with both film and television, the internet has fundamentally altered the way we consume entertainment. You no longer have to get off your comfortable couch, get in your car, drive to a cinema, stand in line, buy a ticket, pay outrageous amounts for popcorn, and sit in a the theater with people behind you who talk all the way through the movie. With the advent of day in date releasing, which means the movie's available online at the same time as it is released into the, the cinema, you could stay at home on your comfortable couch and watch it. You never have to move. And attendance figures suggest immobility is being increasingly embraced by the Canadian public. By way of example, a film of mine called Passchendaele was released seven years ago and it took in almost five million dollars at the box office. By contrast, we recently released Hyena Road, this movie about our involvement in Afghanistan. The reviews were overwhelmingly positive, the marketing campaign was impeccable, and support from the exhibitors was unprecedented. In spite of that, we will top out at the box office somewhere around 1.5 million. That's a 70 percent drop in projections. And it gets uh, worse. This is really fun, huh? It gets worse. <laughs> now it'll get better. Uh, <laughs> in comparison with other independent films that were released around the same time, Hyena Road is a runaway success. Deepa Mehta has a film out called Biba Boys, which the numbers are awful on. Adam Goyne's latest film with Christopher Plummer is even worse. So these are parlous times indeed for independent film. It is abundantly clear the film is undergoing its most radical transformation since the introduction of sound. And what shape it will eventually take as everyone involved in this business around the globe scratching their heads. It may be that film simply disappears as an artistic form. There are times that I feel like I could be one of those poets, you know, in the late 1600s who notices the declining popularity in the sonnet. That's my stock and trade, the sonnet. And Undeterred, I insist that, well, people will still need sonnets. 400 years later, and almost no one even knows what a sonnet is, let alone need one. It could be that movies face the same fate. Optimistically, however, I believe that movies are not dead yet. And if they continue, the one thing that is blazingly clear is their future will be on the Internet. And this is a massive and unpredictable challenge for us. If Canadian movies had difficulty focusing and attracting audiences to the cinema, the challenge is many magnitudes more difficult on the crowded, noisy, buzzing, clamoring thoroughfare that is the net. So the task ahead is frighteningly complex. How do we adapt and retool our systems for producing Canadian film so that they can thrive in the stateless internet? How will Canadian audiences even know we've made a film, let alone how to find it? And what kind of business model do we need to invest, to invent, to finance the costly enterprise of making movies if there is no longer any cinema box office? Now, to be fair, these are global problems. They're not just Canadian problems. And Canada is really just a part of a very complex web of independent film, but we cannot allow that to lull us into action, inaction. If we believe, as I do, that cinema is an essential part of our cultural life, then we've got to brace ourselves and tackle these problems with clear eyes and courage. While our history in this regard is not entirely promising, it remains my hope that the current generation has both the foresight and the fortitude to avoid the calamitous mistakes of their forebears. And now, I'm going to turn to the weirdest one of all, and that's television. You know, what a twisted tale. The history of television in Canada actually began with radio and the passage of the first Broadcasting Act in 1932. And this act may well have been a corrective reaction to the failure of addressing the problems presented by cinema. 
Its aim was to encourage a vibrant radio network that would act as a bulwark against the growing and seductive power of its U.S. counterparts, something that was deemed essential at the time because, as we know, the bulk of our population lives in a ribbon along the U.S. border and was being bombarded with American radio signals. And although the original act was concerned with radio, it provided the basic structure to govern television, which was rapidly approaching. In 1948, there were roughly 45,000 television sets in the United States, and the networks of CBS, ABC, NBC were already up and running, although much smaller. By contrast, Canada only had 325 television sets. I don't know where that, now how do they know that? Any, uh, I found that, and I liked it. Uh, yeah. I think I have like 325 in my own house now. I don't. <laughs> but we rapidly caught up, and in 1952, CBC Television began broadcasting its signal. Uh, private television station, stations were allowed into the field in the 1960s, and that roughly laid out the structure that still exists 60 years later. In 1968, the Broadcast Act was further amended to include the creation of what is now known as the CRTC, or the Canadian Radio Television Telecommunications Commission, which was tasked with regulating and overseeing the traffic on our airwaves. For a time, this regimen seemed to work. While there was still an enormous amount of U.S. programming flowing across the border, both in radio and television, the domestic industry expanded and found a substantial and dedicated audience. Where things began to go off the rails, in my opinion, is in 1972 with the introduction of what is known as simultaneous substitution. And for those of you not familiar with this or SimSub as it is also known, it is the practice whereby an American television program is simultaneously broadcast by a Canadian network and the U.S. commercials are pulled out and Canadian commercials are substituted. The introduction of this <clears throat> was lobbied for by the private networks. The CBC was excluded from this. And the private networks claimed that the increased ad revenue they would enjoy would be plowed back into the creation of domestic drama. The CRTC was completely conned by this argument, and they mandated it. And predictably, the increased revenue was plowed not into domestic programs, but into the pockets of the networks. And no matter how ill-advised, once such a regimen is introduced, it is virtually impossible to unintroduce it. And this particular regimen was like crack cocaine for network executives. It had the effect of stifling any true desire, or more importantly, necessity, to manufacture domestic programming beyond the bare minimum that was demanded from them in their conditions of license. Why go to the trouble of developing your own programs at enormous cost with no guarantee of success when you could simply buy an already proven American show at very little cost and soak up the advertising revenues? I mean, if I were running such a network and get, could get away with such a con, I'd do it too. And thus began the ongoing tension between the twin objectives of the Broadcast Act, namely to foster healthy broadcast businesses and to cultivate a robust community of producers of television. And it became a long tug of war between art and commerce, between corporate interests and cultural imperatives. Occasionally, the artistic side of the battle would be in the ascendancy such as in a few of the years that Due South broke through and played around the world, and our television awards seasons featured a packed slate of tremendous Canadian series. More often, though, the cultural side lost, as was apparent to me in 1999 when I finished working on Due South and I looked around and realized that Canadian dramatic series had virtually disappeared from primetime. And this had been the result of a dreadful ruling from the CRTC that virtually relieved the broadcasters from any obligation to make dramatic series in prime time. Now, as a sidebar, I should, it should be said that the CRTC has an extraordinarily difficult job, but they should be doing it better. 
they have almost invariably sided with corporate interests over cultural interests, which is not entirely surprising. Most of the commissioners who sit on the commission came out of broadcasting or have a broadcasting background. Most of them do not have any real contact with the cultural sector. And corporate lobbyists, represented by Canadian Association of Broadcasters, spend a staggering amount of money every single year persuading anyone who will listen in Ottawa that they need to be relieved of their terrible and burdensome obligations. Now, it was about this time, like around 1999, when I became involved with lobbying against the erosion of Canadian drama. And this proved to be a st staggeringly depressing struggle. And one that was, in spite of some paltry concessions, largely unsuccessful. I will say one thing, as Lana, it's not actually in here. Um, I had, I, uh, not that I know that he would have made a tremendous prime minister, I'm just really sad Paul Martin disappeared because he was the one guy that I met who understood everything about the state we were in and had an actual plan. And I mean, I know he lost, it's just real drag. That we then went in for a very long period with a government that had no interest in the arts whatsoever, which also is part of the problem. I don't really address governmental willingness, but I will just quickly. You have to have a government that cares about it, that sees it as being important. Because that, I'd say certainly during the years of Harper, and it also includes most of the years of Gretchen, we have governments who didn't really think much about it. But when governmental will is applied, it's amazing what you can accomplish. Uh, I think Quebec is a fantastic example. We all look with great jealousy at the consumption of uh, art in Quebec, and the, you know, the film business is, is amazing. Their, their percentage of box office hovers, never goes below 20, 25%, and as high often as 50%, which is stunning compared to our 1.5%. But it must be remembered that 25, 30 years ago, while French Canada was making film, French Canadians weren't going to it. It was a governmental will that focused everybody's attention on it, and the consequences are that Quebec culture is phenomenally vibrant. Anyhow, I should have left that maybe for questions. I'm going to continue. <laughs> yeah, so this lobbying was, was largely unsuccessful, and, and as you can imagine, this was completely bewildering to me because, after all, the issue always seemed very straightforward in my naive mind. A contract existed between the Canadian public and the private networks. In exchange for their right to make bags of money, they would agree to support development and broad, develop and broadcast Canadian drama, which seems clear, right? Ah, but not so, because I quickly discovered two things. First, there is a character trait to corporations that absolutely resents being told what to do. And secondly, there is an inertial power to corporate logic that is almost impossible to defeat. So wherever they could, the private networks would bend, flout, defy, or outright ignore the terms of their contract with the Canadian people. As one owner of a television network said to me in his lavishly appointed office, you don't understand, Paul. I'm not in the TV business. I'm in the billboard business. I run a billboard. I was in Winnipeg. Asper. One of the main arguments the networks regularly trot out in defense of their resistance to these obligations is that they are duking it out in the tough competitive arena of private enterprise. This is a ludicrous canard. They operate in what can only really be characterized as a sheltered workshop at the pleasure of the Canadian people to whom they owe their livelihoods. If it were actually true, if they were truly in competition with, say, the American networks, they would go under within a week. And in part, this would be because the executive class of Canadian television has been, with very few notable exceptions, singular in its incompetence, short-sightedness, and brain-dead decisions. I'm going to get so many emails from those brain-dead people. <laughs> Up until a year ago, however, there was always still some hope that if we kept fighting, we would eventually win the day. And now I fear this is probably impossible. 
Two years ago, the Competition Bureau approved BCE, or Bell's, Bell Canada's acquisition of Astral Media, and the final consolidation of Canadian television assets was complete. The telecom companies that now almost own almost all of our television are now in the category of not just too big to fail, but a brand new category called too big to fight, as was demonstrated when the government tried to introduce more competition into the cell phone field and were delivered a humiliating defeat. Beyond this problem of unassailability, the consolidation of television in Canada has set Canada against the general flow globally of television. When I started out in this field, there were about 15 outlets in Canada where you could try and sell programs to. And in the US at that time, there were only three. Today in Canada, there are only three outlets. And in the United States, there are now over 85. Canada is going 100% in the wrong direction. And this situation has resulted in television networks that do not need to make TV, great TV, in order to survive or profit. They only have to buy it. Their profits do not result from innovative courage, but rather from cautious repetition. It does not take a rocket surgeon to know that law and order is going to be popular again. And this has bred an approach to the programming of the very few shows they actually make that is aimed for sale at the lower tier of the U.S. market. So much so that a Canadian network executive has often been quoted as saying, if your show doesn't have a U.S. sale, then don't bring it to me. In essence, admitting that we are little more than a branch plant for American consumption. And I have nothing against these shows. Indeed, many of my friends work on them, and I think they're well made. But they are generally unambitious, generic, and they are much less than what we are capable of. <clears throat> and I often hear commentators, even people like Michael Enright, asking the question, why do we not make shows to rival House of Cards or Borgen or the delights from the BBC? The answer to that is, of course, we can. But the sad fact is that no executive in our current networks would ever buy them. And this inane approach to their business has left the private networks without much in the way of content. This is the word we use to describe show, the content. Uh, it has left the networks with not a whole lot of content to sell. They simply don't make enough shows. And this short-sighted quarterly profit thinking has left them miserably unprepared for what is now underway, the wholesale revolution in television as it migrates from conventional TV to the internet. And on the internet, content is everything. So what does it profit you if you have a store but you have nothing to sell? It may well be that in the new world of online streaming, the private networks will disappear altogether, victims of self-inflicted wounds. But I would argue that we should hasten their end. And this must begin with an acknowledgement that we have utterly failed in our attempts to compel the private networks to believe as fervently as we do in the importance of our own national television. We will never accomplish this. So I think the time has come for us to concede to their long-standing wishes, relieve them of their obligations, cut them loose, and set them adrift from the public system altogether. I would propose that we then lift a page out of their corporate playbook and we undertake a consolidation of our own a cultural and artistic consolidation in which all of our creative talents and resources are concentrated into one powerhouse network. And what would be the name of such network? <laughs> you might be wondering. Yeah, the venerable, the much maligned, the constantly troubled Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I'm sure, there are, I'm sure there are many of you out there who's wondering when I get around to the old mothership. Well, here she is. <laughs> Lord knows the CBC has had its share of dark days, has been virtually filleted by perennial cuts, rocked by labor unrest, scalded by scandals, which I hope are finished, 
And it was almost driven off a cliff by 10 years of spectacularly inept leadership. And yet, she still stands. And under the new leadership, the winds of optimism are blowing again for the first time in a long time through the hallways of the HQ on Front Street in Toronto. <laughs> the CBC does not have to be threatened. It does not have to be cajoled <clears throat> into making Canadian programs. That is the reason it was born, and that's the reason it continues to exist. I don't want to give you the impression this would be a simple undertaking. Indeed, it would be a massive overhaul requiring enormous systemic repair and expansion of production capacity in order to fulfill the needs of what would have to be a brilliant transition from over-air broadcast to a muscular presence on the internet, where we would generate revenues from sales of our unique programs to audiences around the world. It would also encounter hysterical opposition. The private networks would stamp their feet and claim, as they always do, that they're fanatically devoted to Canadian programs. Well, we would have to say, hey, fellas, just because you slapped a Canadian flag on your backpack doesn't make you Canadian. And as the unions and guilds that represent Canadian artists and technicians, well, they will also balk because they're addicted to the slow and inexorable death brought upon them by the status quo. Well, we would have to abjure this opposition be resolute and steadfast in the face of mighty opposition, persevere in the righteousness of our cause, and we would triumph and create film and television that is vigorous and confident and the envy of the world. Or could we? <laughs> could such a thing ever be accomplished? It seems unlikely. But it seems equally unlikely as I stand here in Charlottetown that Canada itself even exists. Many years ago, a group of people gathered here in Charlottetown and willed a nation into being, a nation that has endured and prospered and now stands as a model for the rest of the world. We are a wacky people, we Canadians. But when we bring our will to bear, anything is possible. Thank you. You know, folks, there was one part of uh, Paul's speech that I had a lot of empathy for, and that was the, uh, the logics course that he took. <laughs> we aspired to the same conclusion at the end of it. <laughs> now I have to find my spot. Folks, it's now my pleasure to invite Mr. Adam Brazier to the podium to thank our guest lecturer. Adam Brazier, the Artistic Director of Performing Arts at the Confederation Center, is a multi-award winning actor, director, and producer. He recently completed his first full season in this role following an acclaimed 2015 Charlottetown Festival, which included an all-Canadian playbill and new partnerships with the National Arts Center, Stratford Festival, and Citadel Theatre. Adam previously co-founded Toronto's Theatre 20, an artist-led company devoted to developing story-driven Canadian musical theatre. Serving as its inaugural artistic director since 2009, he led the development of several new works, including the world premiere of Bloodless, The Trial of Burke and Hare, which was nominated for nine Dora nominations. Adam's accomplished acting career includes originating the male lead in Andrew Lloyd Webber's The Woman in White on Broadway, and also the male lead Gabrielle in the 2013 Charlottetown Festival musical Evangeline.
The Toronto native has held starring roles with most major Canadian theatre companies, including at Stratford, Shaw, the Canadian Stage, Mervish Productions, as well as in London's West End and with the Chicago Shakespeare Theatre. Nous sommes heureux d'accueillir M. Aidan Brazier, directeur artistique du Centre des Arts de la Confédération. Aidan Brazier est un comédien, metteur en scène et producteur lauréat. Il vient tout juste de terminer la première année de son mandat à ce titre, année qui s'est terminée par une saison 2015 du Festival de Charlottetown, couronnée de succès qui comprenait une programmation entièrement canadienne et des partenariats avec le Centre national des arts le Festival de Stratford et le Théâtre Citadel d'Edmonton. Co-fondateur de Théâtre 20 de Toronto, dont il a été le premier directeur artistique, il a assuré la création de nouvelles œuvres, dont Bloodless, The Trial of Burke and Her, qui s'est mérité neuf prix d'Ora. Comédien accompli, Adam s'est notamment vu confier le rôle masculin principal dans The Woman in White d'Andrew Lloyd Webster sur Broadway et le rôle de Gabriel dans la production d'Évangénine du Festival de Charlottetown 2013. Cet artiste originaire de Toronto a joué des rôles principaux dans la plupart des compagnies théâtrales canadiennes, dont Stratford, Shaw, Kennedy and Stage, Mervish Production, et on a aussi pu le voir dans le West End de Londres, et au Shakespeare Theatre de Chicago. Mesdames et Messieurs, Monsieur Adam Brazier. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Gross, for that uh, very enlightening and uh, uplifting and at times bleak outlook, but truthful, and importantly truthful. Um, and Paul is known for that, for his candor and his honesty, and it's one of the reasons why so many artists in this country look up and envy and look up to Paul for that exact reason, for his ability to look at our cultural landscape from a macro point. When I was asked to thank Mr. Gross, I uh, immediately thought, well, I should do some more research so what is a Paul Gross, according to the Canadian Encyclopedia? <laughs> Paul Michael Gross, born in Calgary, Alberta, actor, writer, producer, director, musician. Strikingly handsome, Paul Gross achieved international celebrity for his role as RCMP Constable Benton Fraser in Due South, the first Canadian-produced TV series to become a hit on American prime time. And like so many of you here today, that was my introduction to Paul as well. Now for me, this show and Mr. Gross's performance set Canadian men back 50 years. <laughs> Constable Benton Fraser was the quintessential chick magnet. He was offensively good looking. He was overly polite, brave, strong, and got to dress like a frickin' Mountie entirely misrepresenting every Canadian male alive. This created a false representation of what us normal men were capable of, and thus left a generation of women disappointed eating haagen -Dazs watching men with brooms and loop. The Canadian Encyclopedia goes on to describe Mr. Gross as the elder son of an army colonel, Paul Gross appeared in his first television commercial at the age 14, completing his studies at drama at the University of Alberta. Completing, I said. I changed, I scratched out graduating. He embarked on a stage career that included roles at Theatre Calgary, Toronto's Free Theatre, and the National Arts Centre. This is where it got interesting for me. In 1982, Paul Gross won the Alberta Cultural Playwriting Award and the Clifford E. Lee National Playwriting Award for his first play titled The Deer and the Antelope Play. He stole the title. 
That same year, he was nominated for the prestigious Chalmers Award for his second play, The Dead of Winter. Now, his performance as Romeo in the 1985 production of Romeo and Juliet in Toronto's High Park earned him a Dora Award nomination for Best Actor, and in 1988, he won the Dora for his, uh, his, for his role in Observe the Sons of Ulster Marching Towards Somme. Ah, that old chestnut. <laughs> that Paul Gross, in so few years, had been nominated for two Doras, one one, won both provincial and national playwriting awards and was nominated for a Chalmers Awards, continues to be a slap in the face and sets a false expectation on the limits of what us normal artists are capable of. If there is one thing I have learned in Canadian show business, it is to aim for the middle. The encyclopedia goes on to say, in 1985, Gross turned his attention from stage to writing for the television. In 1986, his screenplay in this corner was nominated for a Gemini Award. It's just that easy. <laughs> when his starring vehicle due south was canceled by CBS in the United States after its second season, Paul Gross resurrected it as executive producer and head writer. That same year, he won the 1998 Gemini for best writing in a dramatic series. They just give him awards like candy. <laughs> in 1997, he released a country music CD, Two Houses. Uh, he wrote this with fellow actor and musician David Keeley. Now, I have this CD. And uh, my favorite track, my personal favorite is number nine. It's called Man on a Bicycle. Did you get a Juno for that one? In 2000, he decided to take a year off filming and get back to his roots, do something simple in the theatre. So he played Hamlet at the Stratford Festival. <laughs> I was there opening night, I truly was, I was. And one of my best friends, uh, Evan, was playing Rosencrantz or Guildenstern, it's interchangeable. <laughs> like so many that evening, I arrived salivating over the idea that we'd be watching Mr. TV, Mr. Mountie, Mr. Perfect fall flat on his perfect face. <laughs> what happened was the largest box office success of any Shakespearean play in the history of the Stratford Festival. <laughs> what happened was historic. Mr. Gross's performance was nuanced, beautifully paced, raw, and most importantly, clear as day. Mr. Gross brought new audience into the theater and introduced them to Shakespeare done at its finest. That was a mountain so few actors are able to climb well, and he climbed it brilliantly. And it was all terribly annoying. <laughs> Next, the encyclopedia says, from 2003 to 2006, Paul laid the Paul played the lead role in the hit miniseries Slings and Arrows, a story inspired in part by his and the writer's experiences at the Stratford Festival. It goes on, blah, 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 more awards. I mean, the thing is endless. His first feature film directing debut, 2001, Men with Brooms, co-wrote, co-produced CBC miniseries H2O, which he starred and played the Prime Minister of Canada. It followed in 2008 with a two-part sequel, The Trojan Horse, Passchendaele opens the Toronto International Film Festival, one of the most successful films in Canadian history, Genie Award, Golden Reel Award, a season in Eastwick, a comedy feature, Gunless, and now the critically acclaimed Hyena Road. Now, I could read on and talk more about his brilliant career, but Paul has done something so few Canadians in the entertainment industry have done, something we tend to shy away from. He's become famous. But more than famous, Paul's become valued. He understands that a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And JFK once said, if art is, the, art is to nourish the roots of our culture, society must set the artist free to follow his vision wherever it takes him. And the good news is we are all a part of Paul's vision. 
for Paul's vision has always included Canada. They say there is a ladder of success in Canadian show business, but that it's on the ground. <laughs> that the true mark of success, of a successful career, is not achieving the height of stardom, not achieving great wealth, or sadly, even great joy in one's career. The true mark of success in Canadian show business is longevity. If you can stick it out through the dry years and still get on stage or in front of the camera or behind the mic and practice your craft, you are a success. This is the only honest gauge we have. Unless you are Paul frickin' Gross. When Paul was receiving the Order of Canada, <laughs> he was asked about his home in Alberta, and he said, it's my home, it's where I feel most aligned to. I love to travel, I like to go to other places, but in part, I like doing it because I appreciate where I come from more. I've been given, I've been lucky enough to stay in a place that I know to be my home and to be able to work here. It's a combination of this is where I'm from, this is what I know. My country is the country I like to talk to. In the TV miniseries H2O written and starring Paul, he plays the son of fallen prime minister. And standing over the casket like Mark Antony over Caesar. And for the entire country, he delivers a beautiful eulogy and says, and to those among us, and they do live among us, that would say, what is so rare about this nation that we should struggle to preserve it? My father would say, for shame, for shame. And he would buy you a ticket for an airplane or a train or on a boat or on a bus. Or he himself would drive you so that you can look back at your own nation and see it for what it is. See its singular beauty. Now, this deep sense of patriotism seems to resonate through his remarkable career. Mr. Gross is a constant voice on Parliament Hill, supporting the arts and lobbying for better funding and a stronger voice for our culture. Mr. Gross knows that it's culture that helps people understand each other. When we understand each other in our minds and in our hearts, it's easier to overcome the economic and political barriers that we've created. But first, we have to understand that our neighbor is in the end just like us, with the same problems and the same questions. And it's these questions and these problems at the center of Mr. Gross's films, for his stories are our stories. The Canadian stories that contribute deeply to our collective conscience and greater history. As Gandhi once said, a nation's culture resides in the hearts and soul of its people. Are we not very grateful that that is true? Are we not so fortunate to have a heart and a soul like Paul Gross? Thank you for fighting for a stronger Canadian voices. Thank you for telling our stories, for making positive change, breaking the norm, raising the bar. But damn you for setting up unreasonable expectations for Canadians everywhere. <laughs> On behalf of the Confederation Center of the Arts, Professor Simons, the entire Simons Committee, CEO Jesse Inman, and Board Chair Wayne Hambly, and all of us, all of Canada, thank you for your stories, Paul. Thank you for your craft, your out outspoken love of this great country. Thank you, Paul Gross. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Gross has agreed to answer a few questions, and we have uh, mics set up on either side of the uh, theater. So if any of you would have a question you'd like to direct to him, uh, just find a microphone over here, and we'll, uh, we'll make it happen.
Yes, Great, we're good. We'll start over on this side, please. Sure. Would you like to state your name and if you're representing uh, your career, university, Hi there, my name's, my name's Hugh Payton and thank you very much, Mr. Gross, for coming to Charlottetown today. Thank you. But first of all, I, I do have a question for you, but first of all, I have something to say to Adam Frazier, who did a wonderful job there. I think, Adam, you need to let go. Take a, <laughs> take a deep breath. <laughs> And I think you need to nominate Paul Gross for the first annual Adam Brazier Award in the Arts, <laughs> which would be season's tickets to next year's plays at the Confederation Center. <laughs> Paul, um, thank you again for coming. I wonder, so with your deep knowledge of the history of, uh, of the industry and of the legislation that you mentioned in Canada that allowed or prevented certain things from happening, so logically... I hope that doesn't hinder you. I think you have a firm grasp of logic. What would the next step be in Canada if you were going to persuade the Canadian government or other levels of government? What would the next step be to help the industry? What could the government do? Um, I don't know. That's actually something I've been pondering. You know, the, there was a, the last time that there was an a kind of overview, review of the state of uh, the arts, I I think this is accurate. It was 1999. Clifford Lincoln put out a paper call, uh, headed up a group, put out a paper called "Our a sense of a sense of place, a sense of being." I think it was called. Uh, they made the paper was looking speci really specifically at the means of development, production, distribution of all forms of art, and they uh, made 43 recommendations. That, to my knowledge, and I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure not one of them were ever implemented. Uh, there was also about the same time another paper put out of a sort of overview of arts. So that's, you know, fif over 15 years ago. And it's, I'm not sure, I think it's something that has to kind of come right out of the government. I, I, I think that papers, white papers now, in, I say this not because I'm against the notion of a of government white paper, but the problem is it's really slow. And the conditions that are shifting in, in uh, television and film are shifting so rapidly that by the time you sort of address whatever that problem is, it's now out of date. So I, I think it's something that probably has to come from heritage, but it has to be pushed up, pushed out of uh, the prime minister, frankly. And I, but the, the proposals that I would put forward have to be pretty solid. You can't just kind of, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we, you know, did something. <laughs> I, I, I think it, it, it's one of the really perplexing problems about the ponderous nature of government in a world that technologically is moving so rapidly. You know, it's really, imagine what has happened to all of us in such an incredibly short time. You can watch a whole movie on your phone. This is preposterous. And it, it's not finished. This is going to keep coming. And I, so I think it's trying to figure out some way to, to, to quickly get ahead of what will rapidly be an enormous problem if we don't. This is, <clears throat> and this is kind of an odd way of, it's not really part of the question, part of the answer, but it sort of is. I mean, I, I, for a long time I felt that the only thing we really needed was protection and, and uh, support for culture. The problem with, only, with that as the only solution is that it, you, you kind of can't outwit corporate logic. It will eventually, no matter how, what system you set up, it will eventually, and I'm not against business, so don't get me wrong, so I'm against corporations. I'm not a real fan of the private corporations running television, but in general, it's not like I have any antipathy. But cor corporations have, have a way, because it's their real function, of driving all of the money down into there. And it's not really much, you can't really set up a, re a regulatory framework to prevent that. That's been my experience, at least in the, in the film and television business, that it's inevitably somehow it's going to end up that the money goes sort of where it's not supposed to go. Or not where it's not supposed to go, not where it is exclusively supposed to end up. So that what we erected was a system designed to support a healthy business and healthy uh, generation of Canadian uh, television, it is really only work for the healthy business. And that's, 
So that's sort of the, the complicating feature of it all as well. It's, it, I don't think there is a regulatory framework to correct that. And when I look at what's going on in the United States, which really is wide open capitalism, there are virtues to that. The comp competitive environment is, is meant, it's all, anybody with a great idea has, has a place to go. Anyone with a great idea in Canada has nowhere to go because it's a locked off frozen system. And so I'm not sure how to, I'm not an economist and I have no idea how you actually address that kind of level of complexity. But I do think that something needs to be thought about that will, that could be presented to a government uh, as, as to at least table a, the beginnings of a conversation. Because if we don't do something, it's all really ultimately just gonna fall apart, I think. And, and the biggest problem is that these media are us. They're not, without it, you can't lose any piece of this without losing a big piece of who we are and how we define who we are. And right now it is, it is virtually ignored. And I mean that also within, with all of my colleagues who work in the field, except for us sitting around at lunch going, holy Christ, is this or bad? What's going on? I mean, that's about the level of conversation that, is, that has been arrived at so far. That we just know there's a problem, but nobody really knows the solution. I think in the television field, yeah, I really do believe that we need to concentrate our efforts into one big, robust, powerful, muscular store where everybody in the world knows to go and find us. We're spread out all over the map and we're in, in and around American programming on the other net. We just need to have one place. If also, would finally answer the question once and for all, uh, are Canadians actually interested in Canadian television? I know the answer to be yes, but at least we could say, yeah, look at that channel. It's, it's doing awful, you know? We also missed a real opportunity just a couple of years ago. Uh, I was part of a group that was trying to put together a, can uh, a channel that would be added into the basic carriage on cable, um, or mandatory carriage. It was called Starlight, and it was going to be a, 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 the home of Canadian cinema, so that we, you know, your movie would play in the theaters, pay TV or however it would work, and then it would have a home, and you would know, everyone would know, oh yeah, I go to that channel and people will watch it. Well, it was shot down by CRTC in yet another one of their mystifyingly stupid decisions. And no, they're really a weird bunch. In fact, we had, huh, you like this, we had a guy who, a guy who was a, a, a former, I think he was like the head of a campaign manager for Harper named Ken Busenkuhl or something. And he was advising us. And the guy was hilarious for one thing. But he said uh, how to talk to the commission. We all had to rehearse how to go in front of the commission. Like, I've never been in anything so weird. I suppose like maybe going to the Roman Curia would be strange. And he said, and I said that. I said, is this like going to the Vatican? He said, uh, yes, yes. For all intents and purposes, you are speaking to the Pope. <laughs> He's an appointed commissioner of a regulatory body. He's not a religious figure. He is a religious figure to you. All right. Uh, anyway, that's, I got off topic there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, they, they knocked it down in part because the cable comp the, the telecom companies came out with such aggressive opposition an extraordinary campaign of lies, spinning their own numbers to make it look like they care about Canadian content, and all of it was nutty. They, it wasn't going to cost Rogers, Tellus, or any of these guys a penny. It was going to cost the Canadian public maybe another, I think it was 90 cents, 90 cents a year or something. I mean, it was a month, 12 cents a day or something. It was like ridiculous. Shot down. So we lose these opportunities every time, and my faith in our ability to correct it from the margins is no longer there. I have tried, been part of a huge group of people trying to do this for years, and years and years we get nowhere. So I think that the only thing to do is just to radically uh, rebuild it, and that's going to create a whole lot of upheaval, but I think it's the only way to do it because I think without it, it actually is just not going to survive. We're not in any shape to contend with where television is going to be within the next five years. So. All right, thank you. Somebody ask a shorter question. <laughs> oh, over here, please. 
Uh, hi, um, my name is Levi Goodet, or Goody if you're on PEI. Uh, I actually met Mr. Gross here uh, over in Halifax at the AFF, but uh, I guess I was too starstruck. I never actually introduced my name whenever I was there, so. <laughs> um, but uh, my question is, has it, you mentioned that like television and film has gone downhill. Has it been harder to get budgets and like uh, bigger budgets, I guess, as the, bu the size of the budget's gone down and is it harder to find the funding now or uh, how is that working out, I guess, with our... Well, financing is always in the worst part of doing any of this. It's a nightmare. And uh, I don't know, but I'm always seeming to, to get myself involved in the craziest financing schemes ever. It's not really usually normal and because they're usually more money. I mean, the, the cap of financing a film today, feature film in Canada, you, if you get absolutely maximized the system out is about seven or eight million. So something like Hyena Road, which costs 12 million, obviously we've got to find alternate sources. And how much time do you guys have? Because I can tell you something really funny. Okay, so the, we, because I'd spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, I met all these Afghans, and one of the intelligence officers who's now become a good friend of mine who has introduced me to these Afghans that they were working with the coalition forces with us, because the characters that are in the film are real guys that I met over there. And he says, I think there could be some money out of the Afghans. I said, well, like how? How much? He said, well, tons. You know, we've given them billions of dollars. And, and I personally have given, like, big A, three million, five million at least. And I know the Americans are giving them the same amount of money. So we made a lot of people very wealthy over there. He said, well, let's talk to one of them. So we ended up getting, <laughs> getting involved in this Afghan money through Dubai that, that then slowed down. And we didn't hear from them for a couple of weeks. Afghans have a very notional sense of contracts. I don't mean this is a, it's not a racist slight, but contracts are sort of notional. They're not actually something that you, that is a contract. So anyway, the contract was not being fulfilled. And then Ted, the intelligence officer said, I don't like how long this has taken. I'm going to get a hold of the cleaner. The cleaner was one of his informants in Kandahar City. So he says, I'm going to get a hold of the cleaner and see if I can stir up a little intertribal rivalry. I said, well, great. So. He gets a hold of the cleaner and explains the situation. The cleaner says, I understand, Mr. Ted. I'll see what I can do. And so a couple of weeks later, he calls back Ted, and he says, all right, Mr. Ted, I got some money. Well, how much? I don't know. We haven't been able to count it, but it pretty much fills up a sea can. <laughs> it's like, like cash in a cargo container on the outskirts of Kabul. And then I'm, I'm starting to lose my mind because we need the money, and it could be like, I don't know, millions. And... And most of it probably was American money because it was like we were th hurling out greenbacks there like in stack pallets, stacks of this stuff. And I'm trying to figure out how can we get the money out of there. And we know we can't bring it through the banks in Kabul because Karzai had buggered up the banking system. So that was basically just a, a money laundering operation. So an international consortium had started to oversee the banking operations. So how are we going to get actual cash money out of there? And then Ted says, well, I know a whole bunch of guys from Tundra. Tundra was like our uh, mercenary group. It's a for hire uh, <laughs> independent contract. So it used to be special forces or uh, soldiers. And he says, they're in and out of there all the time, so they can start bringing it out in their suitcases. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, well, we still can't go in like, Canadian banks. You can't bring in anything over 10000 There's no provenance on this money. And then I'm <laughs> floating floating around on a boat with a, a philanth I won't name him. Well, I will. Don Ross is his name, and he's this phenomenal philanthropist out of Toronto. He's a stock guy, and he's just a, a marvelous man, and, he's, and he's, getting, he's getting up there now. And I explain the situation to him, which I think is really funny. I think he would find funny. He gets dead serious. He says, I got a guy. <laughs> I, what? what? I said, who, what do you mean you got a guy? He said, yeah, I put some money into this. Uh, he's a young guy. He's a hard currency trader out of uh, Dade County, Florida. And he's, <laughs> I put some money into his business, and he's doing really well now. I said, well, how's he going to get the money out of Kabul? He says, he'll go over there, write script, and you take the money out. And I said, well, even if it's got provenance, how do I put it into a Canadian bank? He said, oh, no, you can't. But <laughs> you're shooting in Jordan. All you have to do is get the money into Jordan through Amman. Then you pay all the Jordanians in cash. It's off book, it never even appears on your budget, and there, it's all clean. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like completely thinking this is a great idea. And then, 
We, we sit down with the, <coughs> the lawyers for the company and we explain this great idea. And this guy has like mist coming out of his forehead. <laughs> like, like he's, you know, in the produce section at Loblaws or something. And he says, are, are, can I swear? He says, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> That is money laundering and you will go to jail. <laughs> That's when I thought, okay, I've, I've kind of stepped over the line somewhere here. <laughs> so, I'm sorry, that's a really long answer to, yeah, financing is. <laughs> um, I, I just will add more seriously on it. Yeah, financing is really hard, but <laughs> it doesn't always involve shading money out of Afghanistan. Um, fi financing remains very difficult. I think that it, it qu quite probably is going to become much more difficult as revenues start to dwindle in the box office. I'm not sure what distribution companies will do. Uh, we rely upon a certain amount of advance from them in order to help finance, and I think that's probably going to drop. I, it's just hard to tell right now because everything is in a state of real, it's really unstable. I think that <clears throat> television financing is also going to be difficult. And the other big problem is, is everything moves into the internet and as conventional networks start to disassemble and reassemble, the question becomes how do we get the financing up front to make these things? Oftentimes, there's an analogy made with music. I don't know, music has made the transition, kind of, and it's been hard, but music, at the very least, is cheap. You can make a great record for $7,500,000. You cannot make a movie for $75,000. Uh, and so, you have to get someone to give you the money. And here again comes in now a problem with the Canadian content stuff of it, is that in order to get that money up front, in a pre-sale, these are called, you have to convince somebody that there is the likelihood that it's going to sell. And that inevitably is going to mean you have to get someone in it with a name. We don't have enough names. So that we're going to end up being pressured increasingly if we want to make the, tell the story and make the film to employ American <clears throat> or foreign actors who have a name that probably doesn't mean anything to most of the audience, but it means something to distribution companies. Because when you're going out on video on demand, the way I'm sure most of you, when you're looking, oh, what movie should I watch? You go, oh, I like that guy, and you click that. That's how people choose films. So the, the distribution companies want you to have someone in there as a name that they recognize. They don't maybe recognize Rossif Sutherland, who's a great actor in Hyena Road. And I think in about three years, I would probably not be able to make that film with ha and have him in it. That, that's the kind of imp the, the knock-on impact that all of this has. So. Okay, thank you. Another short question. Over here, please. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'll do my best. My name's Nils Ling. I'm the president of the Island Media Arts Co-op, uh, which represents uh, many of the filmmakers and television makers on Prince Edward Island. Um, we were really heartened this year when we got a, a premier who's interested in the culture of, of this island and interested in, in, in helping to expand the culture of the island. And I was also, we were really uh, delighted that we got a really good response from the committees uh, involved with um, the, the idea behind a, a film incentive program. And what concerns me is that uh, through your entertaining but somewhat depressing presentation today, <laughs> I'm worried that, that <coughs> people such as the, the man to your left might, uh, might be less inclined to think that, that, in, that a province investing in, um, in film and television is a good idea. I don't think you believe that, and I'd like to hear you say it. No, I don't believe that at all. I think we have to maintain those levels as much as we can. No, in fact, the worst time to start pulling out will be right now. We're in a big transition, this is, and this is not a small one. It's a transition as bizarre as when film first arrived and for film when television first arrived. A and the world went, what do we do? And that's where we are, and it'll st slowly sort itself out. What I'm really trying to say, I suppose, is that we have to get out of what we've been doing. We're going to be forced out of what we've been doing, whether we like it or not. So let's get moving now and figure out how we can keep all of this going in modified form, different form, 
whatever it's going to become off into the future. So yeah, no, we can't, absolutely cannot let any of this stuff drop because we'll never get it back up again. Um, and I paid him a considerable amount of money to just guarantee that it will stay there. So you have his guarantee that it's all good. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll have one more question from this side and one more question from this side. So go for, go for it here. Hello, Mr. Gross. My, uh, my name is Will Beckett, and uh, I live here in Charlottetown. I'm a proud independent uh, filmmaker, Canadian independent filmmaker, an island filmmaker. And uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing is uh, geared toward internet distribution. Now, I'm, I'm very new to the filmmaking game, and uh, I, my ears pricked up like antennae when you mentioned the internet as a future distribution platform and, and one we're moving toward. I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, um, given the Wild West, ubiquitous global nature of internet content, such as you'll find on YouTube and such, and, and the fact that so many of our distribution channels online are either American-owned or such as Netflix or, or controlled by private networks like, say, Crave, uh, Bell's Crave service. What are some ways that we, that, that artists in general in Canada, but especially in the film and, and uh, film production arts, ensure preserving a Canadian identity for stuff that is produced for online? Um, I, I wish I actually knew how to answer that. And one of the things I got to confess is that I'm, I'm I'm not real smart about the internet. I, I don't, you know, I just got forced to have a Twitter thing the other, for, and I'm like mesmerized at the stuff people send back to me. But, um, and I don't, I honestly don't know enough about it to know how to, to be specific about what it needs. But in a sense, I think what I'm talking about is saying, let's revamp the one thing that we know is ours, and that is the corp. If we take it, retool it, rebuild it, take everything we've got that's out there, and we got one place to put it there where it's powerful, that place exists both currently on, on over-air broadcast, cable broadcast, but on, on the internet, then we have a store, and there can be subsidiaries to that. Uh, I, think, I think we have to figure out all of us, and maybe it's collective groups as it starts like that, alliances of people who are making films in the same way you do across the country, that you, you create some kind of a site where people will start eventually to, to collect. And I, I, I think in that respect, there's much more possibility of doing that now than there ever has existed before. Because you had to have this massive inf infrastructure to have a television uh, channel you don't really have to have a huge infrastructure to have a website. And if it is of interest, then people will start to collect there. And then you can bring in more and more and you get a, a, a big, the contemporary version of what television networks were in the origins. Because networks were a series of independent channels that all linked up together and decided to broadcast at the same time. That's how it really started. Do, does that make any sense what I'm saying? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, that's about that. as smart as I am. Uh, I don't know. Pass that. Thank you. And our last question over here, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Puxley from here in Charlottetown. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on South Korea's approach to cultural output? And are there any lessons that Canada can glean from that? South Korea's? Yeah. I have thoughts about North Korea. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have no actual working knowledge of South Korea's cultural output. Okay. Sorry. Certainly not enough to say anything about. One more? Okay, our last one. Here we go. Hi. Oh, that's loud. Um, Hi. <laughs> uh, my name is Ray Fright, and I actually have two kind of small questions. Uh, the first one is, what advice would you have for young people getting into this industry? Run. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean that. I think you're, uh, how, how old are you? 17. Yeah, it's perfect. You, you'll be fine. <laughs> it's like the really old guys like me, they're just going, oh, oh, oh. you'll be good. It's, you know, but you're going to, just don't expect it to be what it is right now. 
And the one really big piece of advice I'd have is just keep making stuff. Write whatever, whatever your discipline is that you're interested in, keep making it. Get friends, you can do it now. When I started, you couldn't just go out and grab a 35 millimeter film camera. You know, you've got cameras in your phones, you've got access to really good things where you can make stuff on. And just keep shooting, making, writing, just keep doing it. You get better and better and then as you do that, it starts, you'll start to sort it out. And that's, you build up this library of material that's yours. And you can say, here's what I can do. And someone will go like me, wow, okay, you're on. So just keep making it. Great. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, my second question is, would you be able to stop, sign my copy of Passchendaele? <laughs> uh, that would be possible. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us uh, to the end of our uh, 14th Simons Lecture. And again, a sincere thank you to Paul Gross for this wonderful presentation. Thank all of you. And thank you to Adam Brazier for his uh, very enlightening response. And a sincere thank you to Premier McLaughlin for being with us today and helping with our program. Thank you. And a thank you to my uh, co-partner here, Claude Metra, who knows how to speak French. Thank you, Claude. So, and thank you very much for attending, folks, and uh, we look forward to seeing you here next year. Have a great day. <laughs>